After playing the main story of Vintage White, I found myself in a predicament. Of course, I wanted to move on to other games, but I heard some great things about Vintage White's post-game content. In Vanilla Black and White, the post-game is fairly uneventful, and it's something that I would normally skip in my Nuzlogs. In Vintage White, however, it is absolute cinema. The Pokedex opens up, and the Generation 4 and 5 Pokémon become available, so there's a whole new batch of encounters with unique stat and typing changes. The content here is non-linear for the most part, and there's no real concise story, so in this video I'll be breaking down the key fights, talking about some of the coolest encounters available, and concluding with an absolutely ridiculous set of Elite Four rematches. But before we start, did you know that only 20% of my viewers are subscribed? Just kidding, I made that up. But if you enjoyed the video, feel free to do so and follow me on Twitch where I stream from time to time. If you're hungry for more content or some of the best resources you could possibly find, feel free to join my Discord which is linked in the description below. The first major boss battle in the postgame is Cynthia. She's got a team consisting of Sinnoh's finest like Infernape, buffed Spiritomb, Multiscale Milotic, her signature Garchomp, this time with Dragon Dance, and an absolutely terrifying Regigigas. There's also a Venusaur on this team for some reason. Cynthia leads with Spiritomb as I lead with Aggron. I outspeed and hit a nasty head smash to get it under half. Because of Rockhead, we take no recoil damage. Cynthia's Spiritomb holds a Power Herb, so Shadow Force fires off in one turn. But because of Aggron's massive defense stat and pre-Gen 6 steel resistance, this is inconsequential and another head smash kills. Infernape is out next and Gliscor comes in on a soft close combat. With Chip Healing, we can stay healthy and Earthquake to get Infernape down to its Focus Sash. I can comfortably take another hit, then slow U-turn to take the KO and get a free switch in the process. This allows me to get Sceptile in for free and baits out Cynthia's Milotic, seeing big damage with Ice Beam. Fake Out breaks Multiscale and then with a Life Orb, Leaf Blade can take the KO. We can also chain kill the incoming Garchomp with the Sceptile Special Technician Boosted Dual Chop. Regigigas is out next, and Sceptile is always dead to either Crush Claw or Dynamic Punch, so I can U-turn out into Bandit for free. My strategy here is to trick a Choice Scarf onto Regigigas and lock it into either Knockoff or Earthquake, which have overlapping rules. If it locks into Earthquake, I use Gliscor, and if it locks into Knockoff, I use Lopunny. I need to trick a Choice Scarf here since my Bandit is slower, and tricking something like Choice Specs would risk it getting knocked off. I trick the Choice Scarf, removing its held Choppleberry, and Regigigas locks into Knockoff. Then I bring in Lopunny, who is basically Mega Lopunny with the ability justified in this game. Because of the secondary fighting type, we resist Knockoff and can safely farm two justified boosts to score a kill with close combat. Lastly, I bring in my Salamence to deal with Cynthia's Venusaur, and then take the kill with Fly, winning us the first major battle of Vintage White's infamous postgame. Ace Trainer Wolfie is of course a callback to Wolf Glick, the professional Pokemon player. His roster of Pokemon in this hack is inspired by his famous VGC teams with a little vintage white twist. Wolfie leads with Scrafty and Kofagrigus. My lead Samurott is pre-damaged so that it's always dead to Scrafty's Drain Punch. This is so that the Scrafty never clicks Fake Out into either of my slots. Scrafty's Intimidate also triggers our Defiant ability, so we can be at plus one at the start of the fight. Charizard is in the right slot, and its job is to break through the Ghost Steel-type Kofagrigus. Charizard fires off a Nasty Blast Burn to take out Kofagrigus, and the Boosted Sacred Sword takes out Scrafty. This baits in Conkeldur and Embor, who will both go down this turn. Conk dies to Flying Gem Air Slash, and the now Fire Dark type Embor goes down to a Sacred Sword. This baits in the last two Pokemon, Prankster Thunderous and Life Orb Magic Guard Reuniclus. I bait two kills into Samurott and begin a fairly long process of pivoting around. This culminates in Banet basically coming in for free, and Lapras taking a nasty Psycho Boost. Psycho Boost does recoil damage in this game instead of stat dropping, so Reuniclus with Magic Guard just gets to click it for free. Imagine that change in Gen 5 OU. Banet gets Prankster Swaggered and subsequently attack boosted. I have a Lumberry, so the free attack boost sets up a kill on Reuniclus with Night Days, although it wasn't exactly needed. I then switch to Swampert and Crocodile, who can come in to finish off the Thunderous. 
Swampert gets swaggered, and Crocodile can get a nasty foul play off, activating the Thunderous Citrus Berry. Swampert gets swaggered once again, but it's to no avail since Thunderous goes down to another foul play. I guess that's the world champ difference, and we have now won our second fight of the postgame. After Wolfie, we can backtrack to Victory Road for one last face-off with Sharon. This time, it's a really nasty triple battle. Lucky me. Team-wise, Sharon is more the same with the Unova starter replacing his Hoenn starter. In this case, it's Embor replacing Blaziken. Sharon leads with Glalie, Flareon, and Snorlax. I lead with Dodrio, Metagross, and Samurai. While Flareon sets the sun up upon entry, my first order of business is to bullet punch Glalie. With a held choice band, this is enough for a kill. Dodrio decimates Flareon with a Brave Bird, and a Fighting Gem allows Samurott to kill Snorlax with Sacred Sword. Salamence, Pidgeot, and Embor come in next. I switch Metagross out for Lapras as Dodrio offers itself up as a sacrifice, killing Pidgeot with a double edge and baiting a kill into itself from Salamence. This planned death allows me to get a free Ice Beam off on the Salamence, who lives on just a sliver, but this is not an issue. I bring my Salamence into the middle slot, switch Lapras out for Agron, and Aqua Jet to kill Sharon's Salamence. Then, Strength from Salamence and a Head Smash from Choice Scarf Agron can take out Embor, winning us our last face-off with Sharon. Back in Undela Town, we can take on Benefactor Burrito, the first in a gauntlet of rich kids you can fight in the post-game. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the action replay code that unlocks the full gauntlet to work, so we're stuck with this fight. Burrito is a streamer, and his team is straight out of Emerald Kaizo, with hacks items like Bright Powder and Quick Claw, and extreme RNG abuse with a moody focus band Glalie. Sceptile fake outs the lead Illumise to break the focus sash, and takes the kill on the Bug Psychic type with Bug Gem X Scissor. Glalie comes in, and I U turn out into Metagross. Metagross sits on this thing, so we're not super worried about a focus band activation. Moody does make this a little scarier, just because it can boost evasion, and we actually do get a miss on a bullet punch, but eventually I hit through and exercise this RNG demon. This brings in Steelix, and I switch Gliscor into 1v1. I get a screech off to debuff it, and the big snake does go boom. Thankfully, we are equipped with a Chilin Berry to comfortably eat the nerfed Gen 5 explosion. Aerodactyl comes in next, and I bring in Choice Scarf Samurott to come in and blast it with an Aqua Tail. I'm now staring down a Bright Powder Sandvale Cactor, and shit is about to get scary. I'm Choice Locked into Aqua Tail here, so I bring Sceptile back in on the incoming Leaf Blade and misplay pretty egregiously. I fake out into a U-turn with my no-guard Sceptile because I totally forgore about Bright Powder. This was an egregious misplay with the literal best Pokemon in the game. I'm good for about one of these a video if you haven't figured it out already. However, this U-turn does let me get Salamence in for free and outspeed and Oko Flygon with Outrage, winning us the fight. But that was scary. I definitely needed a better line where I could play around the evasion. The apex of this postgame is, without a doubt, the Elite Four rematches. These are all double battles and have some hilariously overpowered teams, which, relative to the rest of this game, is really saying something. Each Elite Four member has a legendary or mythical ace, including the champion Alder. My team has two returning members, Sceptile and Kingler, and they kind of do the same stuff. Sceptile brings fake out support and fast kills, as well as consistent baiting ability due to its frailty. Kingler provides value as a shell armor tank with an excellent defensive typing, but as we have learned earlier, it's also far from passive. But we're familiar with those Pokemon, so what about the new guys? Samurott can be found in Undela Bay and is an excellent water fighting type. It's tanky, has a great mixed move pool, and access to powerful water stab, priority aqua jet, and sacred sword to play around stat boosts including evasion, which is a good niche on this Elite Four. Because all the trainers in this Elite Four pull out the big guns, I decided I was going to do the same. Thunderous can still be acquired in Vintage White's postgame, and this is team member number four. Thunderous has an excellent move pool, featuring coverage like Brick Break, U-Turn, Grass Knot, and of course its signature Volt Switches and Prankster Thunder Waves, which are 100% accurate in this game. This is a great offensive threat, but also a valuable support Pokemon in its own right. 
In the giant chasm, you can find Rayquaza in the place of Kiram. Rayquaza has some very powerful Dragon Stab and is one of the best Draco droppers in the game. But it is also uniquely good for Marshall, because Airlock can clear sand and get rid of Sand Rush on his Excadrill until it exits the field. It actually doesn't do a whole lot, but it is good at what it does. Plus, I love the design and it's cool ass shiny. I mean, surely the legendaries are the best Pokemon on the team, right? Right? Wrong. Allow me to introduce my last team member, Black Embor. Embor is changed to a Fire Dark type as I mentioned earlier, which gives it an excellent matchup into the Elite Four. It gets some stat redistribution as well, and mine had the ability Rockhead, which meant that it could spam Flare Blitz and Night Days with zero drawbacks. This guy is a war criminal. Before we start, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Mr. Ding Dong Games, who inspired me to play this in the first place. I routed for Embor and built my team based on his post-game bods, so most of these lines and strategies take some pretty heavy inspiration from him. Grimsley leads with Houndoom and Crobat. I open with a pre-damaged Samurott and Thunderous. Houndoom is choice specs, so Samurott can bait a kill into itself with Houndoom's Energy Ball, as well as a kill from Crobat. I protect Samurott here, and Prankster Thunderwave the Crobat to take speed control. I then take a fast kill on Crobat with Thunderous and switch Rayquaza into Houndoom's Energy Ball. This baits in Crocodile, and I double up into it for another kill while keeping Houndoom alive as it's locked in. Hydragon is next, and Rayquaza is Scarfed to outspeed it, and Dragon pulses the Hydra. I take another hit from Houndoom, and then finish Hydragon off with a Brick Break from Thunderous. The incoming Honchkrow gets hit with a Dragon Pulse, and then I bring in the Big Pig to come take some hits. I then proceed to do over half to Houndoom with a resisted Night Days. I told you, this thing is stupid. Eventually, after a little bit of calking, I get Kingler and Samurott back out, I kill Houndoom, and beat in the scary Darkrai. I protect Kingler and kill Honchkrow, and now we have a 2v1. I switch to Rayquaza on Dark Pulse, Sacred Sword from Samurott gets it low, and Aqua Jet finishes off the fight. This Darkrai has double team, so Sacred Sword was needed for this battle to ignore the evasion boosts. Aitlin leads with an Alakazam and Gallic combo. I lead with Embor and Thunderous. Embor is pre-damaged to draw in a double target, I protect it, and then U-turn to break Alakazam's Focus Sash. This gets in Sceptile for free, and I then fake out Gallade and Sucker Punch the Zam. Sigilyph is out next, which is Sucker Punched by Embor and subsequently killed. After fake out chip damage, Gallade is dead to Sceptile's Dual Chop. Gothitelle and Reuniclus come in, and Gothitelle has Shadow Tag, so I need to U-turn out. Gothitelle holds a Tanga Berry, so it doesn't take a ton of damage, but this gives me a nice angle to get Kingler in. Then, Empor just shits all over the Reuniclus with Night Days. Cresselia comes in, and I can then hit a pretty hard Sucker Punch on Gothitelle, and Empor gets paralyzed, but it's not a huge deal. Kingler takes a soft Dark Pulse in the meantime, and takes care of Gothitelle with Crab Hammer. We totally sit on the Cresselia, and after getting haxed a bit, we can break through Paralysis and 2v1 it without risking much of anything at all. Chantal leads with two of Vintage White's most hilariously buffed ghost types, Sableye and Kecleon. Sceptile flings a King's Rock at Sableye for a sort of pseudo fake out, being able to flinch it. Embor then fires off a massive Night Daze to send Kecleon to go meet Robin Williams. Giratina comes in next, and Sceptile protects, baiting in a Draco Meteor from the big scary dragon. Embor gets off another nasty Night Daze, but this fucker is so tanky that it eats it. Although, it's not really an issue. We planned for this, of course. Sableye does nothing, so it mostly just clicks recover, especially if your item is gone, which lowers the AI scoring of knockoff. Embor can sucker punch Giratina as Sceptile hits a dual chop on Sableye. This Sableye can spread Toxic, so ideally you damage it and it keeps clicking recover. This turn, however, it does get the Toxic off on Sceptile. Chandelure enters the field and I sucker punch it with Embor, taking another KO, and dual chop Sableye again as it starts to spam recover. Jellicent enters the fight, and dual chop from Sceptile plus a sucker punch from Embor are supposed to take it out. Embor gets a crit, so I end up attacking Sableye. Sableye just clicks recover again. Now the Eviolite Dusclops hits the field, 
Cool Shot plus Night Days deletes the Cyclops, and Sableye finally gets a Toxic off on Embor. I switch Rayquaza into Sceptile Slot since we have taken quite a bit of poison damage. Embor fires off a Night Days and finally gets knocked off by the Sableye. Rayquaza comes in and drops the fattest Draco you have ever seen in your life, winning us the third match of the second Elite Four. Marshall is the hardest and riskiest fight in the entire Elite Four. His full sand team returns in an even more terrifying fashion. I lead with Samurott and Thunderous as Marshall opens with Bouffalant who is now part ground type and Gastrodon. I use Fighting Gem boosted Sacred Sword to score a fast kill on Bouffalant and then protect Thunderous. Thunderous is dead to Stone Edge from the incoming Hippodon so I U-turn out and Sacred Sword Gastrodon. I can't attack Hippo with a water move because of Gastrodon's Storm Drain, but Sacred Sword clutches up and gets a massive crit as I switch Kingler in. Gastrodon was a pretty big source of RNG in this fight, since it didn't see any kills on anything, and now it's dead. This baits in the Scary Swamper, and Hippo and Pert both see kills on Kingler with Drill Run, so I can attack Hippo while protecting Kingler. Next turn, I attack the Hippo again and get Thunderous back in for free. This baits in the terrifying Exodrill, and it's got a Focus Sash too. I go to Grass Knot Swampert with Thunderous and Marshall Switch AIs, which totally throws my plan out of whack. I'd assume it did that because the Swampert has a Choice Band, but it's a very uncommon interaction in Gen 5 hacks and something that I didn't know the AI did. Exodrill goes for a Swords Dance, which is terrifying, but I'm able to bring it down to its Sash with a Sacred Sword. I Aqua Jet Exodrill and decide to Thunderbolt Cobalion to keep tempo. This gets it low as it hits a nasty rock slide which would have killed the genie if it scored a critical hit. I switch Kingler back in on two rock moves and Sacred Sword Cobalion to KO it. This leaves me in a 2v1 with Swampert. Swampert is now choice banded into Stone Edge and it decides to attack my Kingler slot as I switch Rayquaza in. Thankfully I had a Charty Berry and could live it. I didn't need it for the champion fight, but the switch AI caused some unnecessary risk. Anywho, I can Grass Knot and KO the Swampert, winning us our final match of the Elite Four. Alter is a single battle, and the final fight in Vintage White's postgame. He leads with a Drought Volcarona, who holds a Focus Sash. Sceptile kills it with Fake Out into Strength. With a Dragon Gem, Dual Chop can Oko the Zekrom. Zora comes in next, disguised as the Cofagrigus, and gets hit low with Dual Chop. Sceptile dodges a crit sludge bomb and successfully 1v1s it, although this doesn't really matter considering what I have in the back. I sacrifice Sceptile to Archaeops, and Choice Scarf Thunderous kills it and Unpheasant back to back. Thunderous also manages to pull off the 1v1 against the Coffin, but again, I had a full team in the back ready to deal with it. Anywho, that's Vintage White's postgame completed. It's not something that I normally do, but I really enjoyed playing through the post game this time around. First off, the Pokemon changes are ridiculous, and I like how off the rails everything is. There's even more hilariously overbuffed Pokemon, and you can catch some of them too. The battles were a lot of fun, and I had a great time planning the boss fights and Elite Four rematches. I'd recommend playing this if you had the time, and I'd carry over my high ratings to the post game as well. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and follow me on Twitch where I stream runs like these. I hope everybody has a great day. Jude out.